Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Atlantic Council and the Commander Series, and, and Happy New Year to you all. It's good to see you all here again. Um, on behalf of Saab and the Atlantic Council, I'm Mike Anderson. I'd like to introduce uh, the first uh, event of this series this year. Um, the Commander Series, which we have jointly developed between the Council and Saab over the years, the last 10 years, have become sort of a flagship speakers forum for senior military and defense leaders. As in a few examples, in 2019, we had then uh, Secretary of the Army, Mark Esper here. We also had then Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Joseph Dumford, and then Chief of Naval Operations, John Richardson here. So a good year for the Commander Series. And now we're off to uh, a flying start of the program in 2020. Today we are very honored to have General James McConville here, Chief of Staff of the US United States Army, as our guest. And he will cover the topic, the future Army in great competition. And uh, so we currently today have solutions and capabilities provided to all branches of the US Armed Forces. And we are particularly proud of the relationship we have with the United States Army. And we're looking forward to work with you to develop new capabilities as well. The General will be introduced by the Distinguished Atlantic Council Fellow and former Assistant Secretary of Defense, the one and only Frank Kramer. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Frank Kramer. I'm a director of the Council and also a Distinguished Fellow at the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. And again, I want to welcome you all here and to those who are, are watching. Uh, the event, uh, as was said, is part of the Scowcroft Center to develop sustainable, nonpartisan strategies to address the multiple vital security challenges that we have uh, facing us all. And the Center seeks to honor General Brent Scowcroft's legacy, his legacy of service, his commitment to nonpartisan approaches and the cause of security, to supporting U.S. leadership and also working with allies and partners. And as Mike said, the Commander Series is really a flagship series for us. Uh, we bring in senior leaders, uh, military and defense, to discuss current strategic issues. Uh, so thank you very much, Michael, for your, your introduction, but especially for Saab's support of the series. Uh, since it began, actually, and it was in 2009, so we're doing this for about 11 years now, um, it's really helped shape the security approaches of the United States by bringing leaders here to discuss what they think needs to be done, and to interact with those in the community who have their own thoughts. Um, it's a rapidly changing security environment. We all know that. And so we need to do new things differently. Uh, starting in 2017 with the National Security Strategy, the 2018 National Defense Strategy, the focus has really shifted geopolitically toward renewed great power competition, uh, Russia and China in particular. That's a threat assessment, if you will, uh, but an assessment is only a start, and really to maintain deterrence, we need to do multiple things. Uh, we need effective strategic planning, we need critical investments, we need intelligent innovation, and how to bring those things together is a key issue for people like General McConville, uh, people who are in the leadership positions and then need to transmit their ideas to the people that work with them, or in my opinion, actually the people for whom they actually work uh, to empower. Um, the Army faces a lot of challenges, as do we all. Um, maybe six uh, different areas of conflict, uh, Russia and Europe, uh, China and the Indo-Pacific, Middle East and Iran, North Korea, terrorism, Afghanistan. Uh, in working in these areas, you have to bring together let's call it five domains, uh, land, sea, air, cyber, and space. Um, all need to be coordinated. We have four services. Uh, they're supposed to work jointly together. Uh, that was the plan from about 40 years ago. Uh, and now a fifth. So Navy, Air Force, Army, Marines, and now Space Force. There are really two or maybe multiple time frames. Uh, there's the now. What do we do with respect to present contingencies? There's the future. Uh, and how do you look at the future? Five years, 10 years, 15, how to think about that. And then in the overall, one needs an integrated strategy. How does what the military does fit with diplomacy, with economics, with information, 
to get to a solution that protects our national security and protects the security of our allies and partners. And to do all this, we really need to focus on people, as I think I'm sure you'll hear the General say. The General is the 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Uh, he is responsible, along with the Secretary of the Army, for organizing, training, and equipping the Army to prepare for the variety of present contingencies to enable it for future warfare. Uh, before assuming his position in August 2019, he was the Vice Chief of Staff. Uh, he's an Army aviator. His previous command assignments include Commanding General of the 101st Airborne. He was Commanding General of CJTF-101 during Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Uh, the General will give a presentation, uh, and after that, there's going to be a moderated discussion and an opportunity for uh, questions. Uh, the moderated discussion will be led by my good friend, Valga Meridian. Uh, he's the founder and editor of Defense and Aerospace Report. He's a highly thoughtful reporter. He's a commentator on defense policy, innovation, technology. This, rec uh, this event is uh, public. It's on the record. I encourage you all to join the conversation both here and person and those who are not here in person on Twitter uh, following the uh, ace, uh, at AC Scowcroft and using the hashtag AC Defense. Uh, and with that, uh, please join me in welcoming General Conville to the podium. I, I brought my lunch here, so. Just. Well, well, first of all, good morning, and, and, and thanks for coming out. I really appreciate the, the kind introduction. Um, and you mentioned uh, General Joe Dunford, and just for some of you may know, um, I grew up with General Joe Dunford. Uh, we live in the same neighborhood. And when we were kids, people go, did you know him? Yeah, oh, absolutely, I knew him. When we were kids, uh, we used to play Army together. <laughs> we never played Marines, <laughs> never played Navy, and never played Air Force. He will deny that to this day. He was playing Marines while we were playing Army, and so. <laughs> Just saying. So, as many of you know, last last week was a was a, a very uh, busy week, uh, you know, here and, and, and around the world, and certainly in the Middle East. But what's interesting, you know, I, I ended the week um, up at West Point at the United States Military Academy, and you know, it, it was it was interesting because um, Army was playing Air Force in hockey. And we're going to talk a little about great power competition, but that is great service competition. And, you know, the game was an incredible game. Um, went into three overtimes, and then there were ten shootouts, and then Army won. And that was important because winning matters when you're in the Army. Uh, but it does. And, but anyways, what, what was really important for me was is I just met these incredible young men and women. You know, and as we go in the future, I tell you what, our, our country is in great hands. And it really needs to be. It needs to be in great hands because we face some pretty significant challenges uh, as they move in the future. And when I think about what the Secretary of the Army, uh, Ryan McCarthy, and I have to do to get ready for the future, you know, it, it's, you know there's that old adage, you know, generals are always trying to fight the last war. Well, we're not. We want to win the next war. And we got to get ready for that. In order to do that is I would argue that Secretary McCarthy and I need to exercise transformational uh, leadership, and we must encourage innovation across the force. We cannot do incremental leadership or lead incremental change. And people say, well, what does that mean there, General? Well, let me show you what it means. Okay, what I have in my bag here is some of the older folks who will recognize it. It's a phone, okay? Get rid of this thing here. Everyone recognizes what a phone is, right? Okay, and when I was growing up as a kid, and you know, some of the older folks that may not have, I don't know, sir, do you have phones? Okay, just saying, okay. So we had phones, <laughs> but these type phones are on the wall, right? They're on the wall. And then we wanted to get mobility. You know, people came to the phone company and said, we need mobility. So what they did is they put a, a long cord on the phone, right? And we were able to walk around the house and, you know, for, uh, with mobility. And, and then people started knocking lamps down and stuff like that. And they said, you know what? We need to get a cordless phone. So we got a cordless phone, you know. And then people said, you know, what we need to do is we want to be able to take our phone outside. 
So we came up with this thing called the cell phone, right? And that would ruin anniversary and birthday dinners for many, many years as we sat there with our spouses and took phone calls during those dinners. So that is what I would say is incremental, trans incremental change, okay? But somewhere along the line, you know, someone came in there and said, you know what? We're going to take pictures with phones. And I want you to take a look back, and you because know, I, I think about that. I'm trying to get, you know, people in the Army to be innovative, you know? And I can see a lieutenant walking into me like a general maybe 20 years ago and going, you know what, sir? I, I got a great idea. I think we should be taking pictures with phones, you know? And I can see myself going, all right, how do you, how do you take a picture with this thing, you know? And, you know, and then maybe even saying something like, you know, we're going to use this phone to navigate. Really? I mean, we got these things called maps, a piece, some of the old people, with, with pieces of paper that we used to use to, to kind of go around and stuff like that. We're going to watch TV on this phone, you know, and I could see us just going, well, you know, the person, hey, nice idea, lieutenant. She walks away and come back, go, well, that's why she's a lieutenant, or that's why he's a lieutenant. And that's what we need to do is we need to understand that if we're going to get to transformational, that we, it, it change, that's what we have to do. And that's what we're trying to do right now in the Army. And when you think about where the Army is, you kind of got to go back and, and see where it came from because it affects everything that we're doing right now. And I had a speech here. I'm not going to use it because I want to make some comments. Okay, so here's, here's, here's how I, I want you to think about. You know, when I went to West Point, it was 1977. Okay, for some of the older folks in here, we're just coming out of the Vietnam War, probably not the best time to be in the military. While we were at uh, West Point, 1979, the Iranians seized our embassy. Uh, we tried to do a rescue operation, and we saw that rescue operation fail in the desert, helicopters on fire, people killed, and we did not have that capability. And then in, in May 27, 1981, uh, that was our graduation. Everyone remember who their graduation speaker was? Anyone? Any? Well, I, I remember, but, but your, yours was ragged. So anyways, most people, if they remember their graduation speaker, they probably don't remember what he said. But our graduation speaker was a 70-year-old man, and he'd just been shot two months ago. And he spoke on May 27th. That was, the, is right, was President Ronald Reagan. And it was an interesting speech, and I don't remember all his words, but I, I do remember what he said. And I do remember what he's, what, how he made us feel, because it's a, it was a very, very different time. He, he made us proud to be Americans. He made us proud to serve. And, and, and the other thing he talked about was he quoted George Washington. And he said, you know, it's, it's, it's peace through strength. It's peace through strength. And he reminded us that, because people used to make fun of how old he was, that he was not there when George Washington said that. And... So from there, we, we, got, we got the resources. There was, there was the, you know, Congress and, and, and the leadership put things together. And we came out with new doctrine called Early in Battle. We developed new organizations like the Ranger Battalions, the 160th, and some special operations units that we've seen over the last years do absolutely incredible things. We set up new combat training centers at the National Training Center out at Fort Irwin. And we stood up at, at, at Fort Polk, the Joint Readiness Training Center. We came up with what we call the Big Five, modernization, the Big Five. And people say, you know, it was the Abrams tank, and it was the Bradley fighting vehicle, and it was the Apache helicopter, and it was the UH-60 uh, Blackhawk, and it was the Patriot. Those five were called the Big Five. And what we've done over the last 40 years is incrementally improve those systems. And, you know, my argument is when you start running out of letters, you need to get new stuff, you know. So, if you, you know, we have models and stuff like that. You need to get new things. And, you know, the other thing we did was we went to the all-volunteer force. You know, we were a draft army uh, during, during Vietnam. And all of a sudden, we, we, we went to the all-volunteer army. And because of that, we, we, we have this incredible non-commissioned officer corps that makes us the pride of, uh, of the world. And people ask us, so what does that have to do with today? Well, if you, you got to know where you've been to know where you're going. And so we have a new national defense strategy that I know you've all read, great power competition with, 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 with China and Russia. And great power competition does not necessarily mean great power conflict. And quite frankly, we don't want it to mean great power conflict. We want to be in competition, and we want to have that competition 
below the level of armed conflict. And the way you do that is you're, you're strong. You're strong, and what we're doing is taking a look at the force we have right now in the Army. And it's coming out of what I would call 18 to 19 years of irregular warfare, counterterrorism, counterinsurgency. That's the type of organization we have. We have incredible young men and women serving. But it's, again, it's not about fighting the last fight better. It's getting ready for the next fight. So what we're doing in the Army right now is we're developing a new concept, multi-domain operations. And what that's going to do is going to be how we're going to fight where we're contested in every single domain. We're contested on the land. We're contested in the sea. We're contest contested in the air. We're contested in cyber. And we're contested in space. And we recognize that we're going to have to operate uh, in areas where there's um, where there's anti-axis air denial bubbles set up over our adversaries. We're going to have to be able to do that. We're going to stand up new organizations. We're standing up multi-domain task forces. We're standing. We're going to finish our security force assistance <laughs> brigades so we can advise and assist our partners and allies. We're recognizing the importance of information operations. So our cyber command is going to become an information warfare command. We're developing new training centers, you know, because now it's about cyber. So we need cyber ranges that we're going to build. We're going to, we're, we're going to use um, virtual reality, augmented reality, so our soldiers can train on missions before they actually have to go. And we're going to modernize the Army with material. We have six modernization priorities with 31 signature systems. They, they, they go across from long-range precision fires to next generation combat vehicle, to future vertical lift, to the, to the network, to air and missile defense, and soldier lethality. And the last thing we're going to do is we're, we're moving from an industrial age system to an information age army. And if you think about it, especially in the area of personnel, we're in a war for talent in the army. We're in a war for talent. We're competing against industry. And we don't have the compensation capability that you all in industry have. But, but here's what we do have. We have the ability to offer these extraordinary young men and women an opportunity to be part of something bigger than themselves. We have the opportunity that, to offer them the ability to be on the most respected team in the country. And we offer their parents an opportunity to see their sons and daughters have a pathway to success. And so we're going to manage and compete for these talents as we move into the future. And so uh, I feel very, very good having been up to West Point and seeing the young men and women, the extraordinary young men, men and women that are coming into the Army. And I, you know, I look forward to the challenges ahead. So I'll, I'll end there, and I'd, I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'll take your questions. Thank you. I'll move my phone. Yeah. I'll take my lunch back. What a thoughtful gift. Uh, one yeah. of the other things you have, by the way, is an extraordinary uniform, by the way. So if I can compliment that, uh, would be. Yeah, could I comment on that a second? Because if you, if you look at this uniform, it, it, it's really amazing. It goes back to you know, a tribute to our World War II generation. And many will argue that World War II was the greatest generation, and, and I, I kind of agree with it. You know, you look at the, the, the people that served. I had the privilege of commanding the 101st Airborne Division. I knew many of the Band of Brothers very, very well um, as far as experience. And many of those, those men and women, they grew up during the Depression. Uh, when our country's attacked, they raised the right hand and they went off to serve. And when you hear their stories and you, you have a chance to meet them, they're absolutely incredible. But I argue that every generation has its heroes. And we see that in today's generation. And I think the baton is being passed to this generation today. You know, we've, we've been in combat for the last uh, 18 and 19 years. And young men and women, extraordinary young men and women, continue to, to raise their hands and say, serve. And so this is a tribute to them. Uh, well, one of those heroes uh, lives in my building. He uh, enlisted on uh, December the 8th, uh, landed in North Africa, and was engaged in conflict uh, throughout, throughout the war. Um, and uh, anyway, um, sir, it was an honor to, uh, to talk to Mark Esper, now Defense Secretary Esper. Uh, and where I want to start is, you know, as, as you mentioned, we're in a time of extraordinary change. You know, you've joked that you've become a data scientist uh, uh, at, at the end of the day. And then technology is actually going to shift the roles of each of the military services in a way, right? It will give opportunity, for example, for the Army to do deep strike, which has been the purview, for example, of the Air Force. Um, as, but the 
you know, China is very different from the Soviet Union you faced in 1981 uh, as a, a second lieutenant. There's a nuclear North Korea. Uh, there's an Iran who that may soon go nuclear. As, as you look at the, you know, at the same time, you have to keep engaging and being in Iraq and being in Syria and 50 other operational nations. As you're looking at this, you know, how do you see the threat and how do you see the role of the army in the joint force as you build both deterrent concepts, but also high-end warfighting concepts? Yeah, I think the Army has an absolutely critical uh, uh, role in, in the future, and we see it around the world right now. You know, we're in Afghanistan, we're in Iraq, we're in Syria, we're, we're in the Pacific, we're in Europe. And I think what the Army brings is, is first of all, it's, it's a highly trained, disciplined, and fit force that can win on any battlefield, and we need to keep it that way, and we, got, we need to continue to modernize that, that it can do that, but, but it also can be worked very closely with allies and partners. And, and that is very, very important, advising and, and assisting them in, in building their, their capabilities and ca capacities so they, they, could, they, they can provide their own security. And that's really what we want to get to. You know, we, I think we all share a lot of interests. I think we believe in the world order as it is. I think we believe that everyone should be able to pick their own um, road, so to speak, or, or belt to success, and I think we need to help people do that. Um, but the change of the order that you're looking at um, requires to do more than just sort of night court or get taller ladders to get higher fruit. That was a, a great line yeah. uh, that you used recently is also deciding what you're not going to do, right? Bridge Colby, one of the co-authors of the National Defense Strategy, was very passionate about, hey, we've got to get out of the Middle East. We have to be focused strategically on China uh, and have a greater sense of urgency in engaging in that. What do you have to do a lot less of and what do you need to be doing a lot more of? Because I think each of the service chiefs feels an enormous urgency as part of the strategic deterrent that the nation is trying to present adversaries like China and Russia. Yeah, I think we, we should only be doing the things that we can do. And if there's other forces, if there's partners and allies that can provide certain capabilities, they can provide security uh, in areas that are lesser a priority, then we need to allow them to do that. One of the organizations that we've stood up and we're uh, expanding on is our Security Force Assistant Brigades. Uh, we're going to have five in, in the active and one in the National Guard. And these are force multipliers because they can go in and help professionalize uh, countries' forces that by advising and assisting and allowing them to provide their own security. We cannot provide security for every single country. We can help them, but we, can't, we don't have the capability uh, to provide security for every single com uh, country. The, the magnitude of the task is, is actually extraordinary, right? People costs are a lot higher than they were in the 1980s. Uh, you're trying to do the major modernization programs, but each one of these takes a lot longer to execute, and we're going to get to the, the speed element of this yeah. in a moment. How, how are you going to do this? Because historically, and I don't want you to sort of get ahead of the budget process at all, but historically the military services have reduced bodies in order to be able to underwrite investment and then en end up losing the bodies and losing that investment as well. And there is a sense that defense spending has peaked at this point. I mean, what are sort of the systemic big think, not just the longer cord solutions do you need to be able to get you to the other side of this because our adversaries, right, Russia field its first hypersonic battery on December the 27th. Okay. Well, I, th I, think, I think what we look at is, first of all, every single person counts. Every single person in the force. We, are, we have modest growth in the military. We, we understand that the, um, that the defense budget is pretty much in the future flat. So it's a zero-sum type game is how we see it. And we've got to make every dollar count. So every person counts. Every dollar uh, counts. And when we look at, you know, what we're going to do in the future, there's, there's things we can do. You know, we look at artificial intelligence. A lot of people look at artificial intelligence and machine learning and think that, you know, we're going to have, you know, all autonomous vehicles or aircraft out there fighting the future fights. Um, I don't see it that way. I, what, I, what I see, especially in the near term, is where we're going to be able to go to maybe more minimum manning or um, where we have less people in aircraft, less people uh, in, in some of our armored vehicles, and that, that, that allows us to, you know, to, um, to create more capability with, with less people, you know, by working very closely with allies and partners and advising and assisting if, if a, you know, a, another, you know, country can provide a, 
a battalion and we have five or six people that are advising that battalion, we have in, in, increased our, our capability on what we need to do. And then as far as dollars and, and a lot of folks from industry here, you know, we're working in a much more innovative way, a much less industrial age when we work with industry uh, as far as developing systems. We can't afford to waste a dollar. Um, we're, we're reaching out, we're looking for uh, non-traditional partners to help us develop uh, systems. Uh, we want to fly before we buy or drive before we fly buy or shoot before we buy and we want to make sure we can get our re requirements right uh, before we actually go into full-scale production and we think that's a, that's a good way to get after these. Uh, and there's uh, an enormous uh, amount of experimentation that's also going on across the force. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, add, you know, since every dollar is precious, do we have any or do you have any indication at this point uh, how the president's decision to redirect another $7.5 billion uh, from military construction and counterterror efforts to the border wall is going to affect any of your strategic investment I, I don't. Um, let me go to uh, the, the question of the big six programs. Um, there's a sense that there was a 1970s redux there a little bit, that that's what you did then and that's uh, what you're sort of redoing again now. And you could argue that even in the last, e even since those programs were named, some strategic things have changed. Russia has fielded hypersonic weapons, for example, and I want to get your take on that. There are those who are even highly experienced uh, Army aviator friends of mine who question, and I know this is problematic having uh, Jeff, uh, General Schlosser here uh, rep representing. No, 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 not at all, sir. Uh, full disclosure, Bell is one of our sponsors and sponsors our podcast. But uh, Army aviator friends have said, have questioned the capabilities set one, for example, and said, yeah. look, you know, it, it worked for Dick Cody uh, and it can work in places, for example, but largely the Air Force spends billions of dollars a year to penetrate enemy air defenses. And there's, there's a lot more of a sense that the Army's strategic long-range missilery will be something more important. Do you need to readjust these six to perhaps drop some of those to augment and expand dramatically other parts of it, for example, the long-range precision fires, which are seen as so important across the force? You know, any capability where Air Force and Navy guys are agreeing with the Army, you know you're on to something? No, I, I think, you know, if you look at our priorities, uh, the number one priority is long-range precision fires. And we are aggressively getting after that. And, uh, you know, we, we, I mean, we're going to be fielding in, in, in two or three years that, that those type of systems that, that we know will be very, very capable. Um, you know, we've had successful tests with our precision strike missile systems. And, uh, and we have, we've been successful with our extended range canning. So I, I feel when I, when I take a look at long-range precision fires, we are investing su a sufficient amount of money in them to get the capabilities we need in a very short period of time. And, you know, coming back to the, the aircraft side of the house is, you know, again, I'm a senior aviator, so I don't want to seem a little biased, but uh, when we look at where we want to go in the future, uh, we know that speed matters, we know that range matters, and, you know, when we look at, and, and cost matters. And so as we work with industry and, and you know, this and, and General Slosher over there and other folks have heard this is, you know, we, we're asking for an aircraft with a certain capability to be delivered at a certain cost and to be able to operate at a certain cost. And those, those are aggressive goals. And what we're asking them to do is, is show us that, you know, show that you can actually fly that thing and put it up in the air and show us that it can do it. So it's just not a... You know, things work very well in PowerPoint, I've found. You know, you, you, they can show you a diagram and those type things. But, you know, if you have to drive it, you have to fly it, you get a pretty good indication of what the requirements are. So when I look at, you know, the future attack reconnaissance aircraft, uh, I don't necessarily say that it is a penetrator. But, but if you, you know, people want to go back and talk about General Cody, who I have tremendous respect for, and that was at the time that was cutting edge technology to penetrate uh, that that uh, air defense, that integrated air defense network. I, I would argue, you're still going to have to penetrate. It's just how you do it. And I would say we would never do that today. I think some people try to do that during the initial part of Iraq. And you know, again, one of the things that we want to avoid is trying to fight the last fight better. We we, we right. want to get ready for the next fight. We want to win the next fight. And I would argue that you've got to understand what you're fighting. So if you have a, a sophisticated, uh, integrated air defense network and you're trying to penetrate that. 
and you have to think your way through how you're going to do that. And there's, there's a lot of ways to get at that. You know, some it's with long-range precision effects, some it's with long-range precision fires. And, and, and by having uh, aircraft with additional range and additional speed, that gives, it, it gives us more courses of action. At the same time, the enemy has more dilemmas that they have to face, and they have to think their way through about where they're going to be strong and what they're going to defend against. Um, how is, is Russia's deployment of these systems game-changing? I, I don't think so. No, I don't. Why not? Because I don't, I, I, I don't, I don't, I guess, how would you say it's game changing? Well, I mean, the sense that it's the first um, hypersonic, uh, you know, glide body vehicle, assuming that we believe what it is that they're saying about it, could, um, you know, we've always regarded that as being a capability that is uh, dangerous, especially applied in a strategic context, right? Which is one of the reasons why we want to develop them. Well, again, as, as I take a look at it, I have not seen them actually uh, hit a target uh, with that system. And I know where our technology is, and, I, and I'm very comfortable where our technology is going and where the speed is going. So I don't see this game changing yet. Um, let me ask you uh, the question about speed. Um, uh, Lockheed Martin, former Lockheed Martin's former chairman and CEO, Bob Stevens, is always fond of reminding everybody three years, nine months is how long the United States was engaged in World War II during that period built an extraordinary amount of ships, aircraft, and also developed an atom bomb. Um, and yet we find that even simple systems are taking us many, many, many years to develop. Your uh, guidance to General uh, Thompson was, give it to me by 2025, then you, for a hypersonic battery, you adjusted that to 2023, uh, and uh, you gave him apparently zero wiggle room on that, and I think he's, he's very cognizant of that. We're, we're talking General uh, Thurgood, right? Thurgood, excuse yeah, me. But sorry, sorry, my, my Make sure my I get the right guy sorry, doing it. Sorry, sorry. Unless, unless there's uh, someone else there doing that, I don't yeah. know. I'd, I'd be a little yeah. concerned. No. That's a, that's a good way to uh, do it. My apologies, sir. No. Uh, General Thurgood. Um, but there are those who say that even that is, is too long. And more broadly, how do we accelerate these cycles, get this capability out a lot faster than we're doing? We're do, starting to do better, yeah. but ultimately we're still not moving at the pace of relevance. Well, I, well, I, think, I think we are. Uh, I mean, we're doing better. I think I, we can never, at least for me as the, as right. the chief, we can never be fast, as, fast enough. We, we always want to get better, but I, I think what we've done with our acquisition processes is fundamentally changed that we still have Army's Futures Command, uh, we still have our cross-functional teams that are working together. So you have operators working with um, the, our, our um, project managers, working with our technology folks, working with industry, and they're able to turn things much, much quicker. We, we used to have a very linear industrial age process that would take three to five years even to get a requirement. We're going to be fielding, right. you know, in three years, actually systems that can do, you know, uh, very sophisticated, complex things. And, you know, and, and we'll see how fast it goes. You know, we're going to go as fast as we can get there, uh, but we want to make sure we get there, too. Can you give me some specific example? You know, when the boss cares about something, uh, everybody cares about yeah. it. When the boss cares about speed and the boss cares about empowerment and innovation, the organization does that. Give me some specific examples about how you're driving speed, yeah. how you're encouraging that innovation, and you're, what you're trying to do on personnel, others have tried and failed. You're trying to game change on personnel. Yeah. Brad Carson famously tried some of this stuff and it, and it didn't work out. Talk to us about how you're driving this change at a fundamental level. Yeah, I think, I think when we take a look at, um, I'll, I'll take personnel. I, I talk about, you know. Um, the most important weapon system in the Army. Yeah, is it people. is. It's the most important weapon system. Uh, but I, I believe that we have to compete for talent. Okay, we're in a war for talent. We've got to get the right people uh, in the right jobs. And I think the most consequential job in the United States Army is battalion command. Okay, because battalion command, for those who have been in the Army, you know, it's a lieutenant colonel. That lieutenant colonel influences five or 600 people, whether they want to stay in the Army or get out of the Army. Right. It's, it's a level of leadership that I think is the most important. It deals with lieutenants and the captains, the sergeants, and, you know, if you take a look at, you know, officers that may have gotten out early out of the Army, you ask them how their battalion commander was, and it was probably not who they wanted or, or, or inspired them to serve. So what we're doing right now, and it starts tomorrow, is we're doing a battalion command assessment program. And so what does that look like is our, all our lieutenant colonels, our majors, senior majors, and you know, new lieutenant colonels that, are, 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 uh, that want to compete for battalion command, 
they went through a board process and we whittled it down to 800 and those 800 are, are going to start coming to Fort Knox uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. and they will go through a week-long process that will te test them you know the ability you know make sure they're fit make sure they're deployable take a look at their comprehensive uh, leadership and potential. Uh, they'll take a look at their peer reviews and subordinate reviews. There'll be a blind board, there'll be a psych, all these type things. So we know we're putting people in the, in the right place, the right job. The way we used to do it before was we had a promotion board and a, or a command board and people would look at their files for about two and a half minutes. You know? And as a result, you know, uh, I, I equate this to a combine. You know, if you take a look at what professional football does, um, they have all, you could be a Heisman Trophy winner, or you could be at some, you know, state school. You come together, and they know the knowledge, skills, and behavior that they need in their future players. And they run them through the system, and that's why sometimes you see someone coming out of nowhere that maybe wasn't, you know, a, a, a Division I player. They can actually make it in the pro. So what we want to do is, is take a look at people and put them in the right place. So I, I think that is, is, is fairly substantial. For, you know, for our non-commissioned officers, we changed the way uh, we, we do our uh, promotions. Uh, we used to do it by time and grade. So you go through a promotion board, and if you get selected for promotion, it was all how much time you had. So if you are a really um, outstanding uh, non-commissioned officer or staff sergeant, you'd have to wait until all the people ahead of you got a chance to get promoted. Right. Now, if you're the most qualified person, you're going to the top of the list and you're getting promoted. And these are the type of things that we're putting in place. Uh, what I want to get to on, on personnel is where we manage people by more than two variables. We basically in the Army manage people by two variables. You're a sergeant of engineers or you're a captain of infantry. And we have tremendous talent out there that we can't see, especially in our National Guard and Reserves. And, it, it, and you know, sorry to say, we presently have three personnel systems. So we have one for the regular Army, we have one for the National Guard, we have one for the Reserves, and we're bringing them together into one system, an integrated personnel and pay system, where we'll be, we'll be able to see everyone's talents, you know, 25 variables, and then we'll be able to manage them uh, by their knowledge, skills, and behavior. And even their preferences, which in the Army is kind of blasphemous, the, the idea that we, we would care where you want to go and what you want to do, and we're putting that in process right now. Um, one of the key integration elements of this is the joint multi-domain uh, operations and the joint multi-domain operations command and control system that everybody is trying to right. engineer. Um, out on the west coast of the West Coast Aerospace Forum, it was great because General Wesley was there uh, from Futures Command, Oscar Meyer from the Navy was there, General Kamashiro was there from the Air Force, talking about how you do this. But what was also apparent is, even though this is the number one priority, each one of the services has their own programs and their own stovepipes. I know that as the service chiefs, you guys talk about this a lot, how do you do this because, uh, you know, as you've said, it, it, you know, everything is a sensor, everything is a shooter. You don't care what takes something out any more than the Air Force or the Navy cares who's getting the job done at the end of the day. But if you don't have this, I mean, it, why is this not moving more quickly and in more concerted fashion? And is it going to take um, something horrible happening? to convince folks, God, you know, we should have moved a little more quickly on this. No, we, we, we are moving out on it. In fact, I've talked to the Chief Staff of the Air Force unit. I've talked together. Our staffs are meeting right now. And, and people say, well, why don't you just do it? Well, you know, it, it, we have made major, each of the services are not starting from a, a, a blank piece of paper. We've made large investments. Uh, we have an integrated battle command system that, that basically links our sensors to shooters. We just had a successful test on that, and, and that's being developed. We have an integrated tactical network that is, is showing success that our, that our uh, soldiers can communicate on, and we're doing a lot of things with, with data and clouds. And so those are three things that, as we bring them up, uh, that General Goldfield and I have talked about, and we're, we're, we're taking a look at who's, you know, where they're at, how do we bring this all together? Because we want a command and control system for the Joint Force. It only makes sense. The question is, how do you do it? How do you bring things together? And it gets back to something we talked about a little earlier, was data. I'm becoming a much more of a data scientist than I ever thought, you know, because if you're going to do command and control, if you're going to do all these type systems, if you want to use artificial intelligence, you want to do machine learning, it really comes down to the ability to deal with data. 
you got to standardize it so everyone can use it. You got to be able to protect it so you know other people you don't want to use it, and then you got to be able to pass it and transmit it in large amounts. And that to me is 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 very important in the future. And that's what we're working right on now. On but we are committed to making that happen because we recognize at the chief's level that all the services need to be able to communicate, and also our partners and allies. We got to make sure we can communicate with them also. Um, you mentioned allies and partners, and, and one concern that surfaced is um, while allies and partners are at the center of how we've fought successfully, whether it was through the Cold War or after 9-11 in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, and elsewhere, even Syria, where there were odd bedfellows, one of them being Qasem Soleimani uh, involved in that. Do you, how do you, what happens if our allies and partners don't want to be with us, right? Iraq now is, is talking about asking American forces to leave. Um, Finland is a very reserved country. Um, I don't have this firsthand, but a friend of mine mentioned that the Finnish defense minister, you know, at a, at a conference mentioned, for example, uh, when it comes to partnership with the United States, raised the scepter of what happened to the Kurds uh, at the end of the day. So we want, we may want our allies and partners to be there and fight with us, but they may decide not to. Are we thinking any form of contingency planning about how much greater stuff we may have to shoulder if our allies and partners aren't there for well, us? Well, I, I think we always have contingencies. We have all types of course of action, but I, I could tell you at least from where the Army is, is we are working very hard uh, you know, to uh, engage with our partners and allies. I've, I've been this job for five months and I've met with 75 chiefs of staffs of various, uh, various countries. And you know, what they tell me is they, they want to work with us. They really do. And you know, they, as we modernize the Army, they want to make sure we don't move away from them. You know, they, they have great respect for what we do. We stay out of the politics. That's you know, what the military does. Um, but you know, there's ways that, you know, there's things that, they, that we can do together. Uh, you know, the, the International Military Education and Training Program is very, very important. So we go to each other's schools and we develop, develop relationships there. Uh, foreign military sales is, is very important, so we, you know, we, we work with each other's equipment and we have a chance to do that training. And then uh, certainly our security force assistance brigades can advise and assist and, and our units can exercise with them. Again, building those relationships that, that, that stay with you for many, many years. There's, there's many partners that we've served together in Iraq and Afghanistan, and those relationships are extremely strong. A um, couple of more questions and then I want to open it up uh, to, the, to the audience. Um, Given China's long-range strike capabilities, um, particularly in the Pacific, the sense is that agile basing is going to be something that's going to be critical. Um, but even then, there are questions about whether or not our ability to be agile will be outpaced by their ability to be able to strike with precision range as well as area denial capability. Um, then add to that the logistics burden of how you support Units. I mean, one of the things I remember from when I was a young reporter was that an armored division consumes an aircraft carrier's worth of weight of supplies a month. I mean, that is a staggering uh, statistic. I'm not necessarily saying armored divisions are going to go roaring around the Pacific, but at the end of the day, it gives you a sense of that magnitude and that every analyst has basically said that we have a shortfall, a shortfall whether it's in lift, whether it's in sea lift to be able to move. Or are you concerned? that agile basing is valid, and what are you doing and what are the chiefs doing on the logistics and sustainability piece of this? Because we have gone to a lot of non-standard equipment that only exacerbates our logistical challenges. Yeah, I think you know, one of the, the tenets of uh, the national defense strategy is dynamic force employment, the ability to, um, to move our forces really all over the world. And, uh, we saw a little of that with the uh, 82nd Airborne Division uh, on New Year's Eve day, uh, when in 20 hours they, that just you know it's in the paper, so we'll be glad to talk about it. But they they, they deployed in 20 hours, unknowing, so they were in a position uh, to basically secure Americans uh, living in Iraq. So um, you know we have that capability. We have to rehearse that. We have an exercise Defender 20 that's going to go on in Europe, and that's going to give us a chance to bring a large amount of forces back uh, into Europe and, and train with our partners there and, and work all those type things to go along with the logistics. And the other thing is we talk about modernization, you know, everyone, you know, we talk about artificial intelligence and some of these other things, people have this vision of robotic vehicles and whatever it is, fighting, you know, but when I look at artificial intelligence, one of the first things we're going to do is improve our logistics. We've done some pilots. 
um, on pre preventive maintenance uh, with our helicopters and we're finding out having artificial intelligence and a lot of data allows us to save a lot of money on parts. Uh, we're also going after additive manufacturing uh, so we don't have to carry as many parts with us and we can do those type things. And then all our programs are, are after you know, some type of fuel efficiency capability because we, we, again, we, we understand the logistics tail and that really influences how we do business. Do, um, let's talk briefly about air defense. Um, there's a sense that the Army doesn't have enough air defenses for itself. The Navy doesn't have enough air defenses for itself uh, at the end of the day, given some of the challenges they may face in the Western Pacific. And that has the Air Force asking, well, hang on a second, so, and a couple of our allies asking, hey, so how do we manage to do this? How much more air defense do we need? And do we need, in part because of some of the technological changes that we're going to see, another roles and missions discussion among the services about yeah. who does what and how they do what? Well, I think, you know, one of our, our uh, modernization priorities is air and missile defense. And, you know, we have, we have the Patriot system in place, we have the THADS, but, you know, the future, in, in my eyes, of air and missile defense is a integrated uh, sensor and sh shooter capability. If you can imagine every radar or every sensor is tied in through some type of integrated battle command system, so you can have multiple shooters. You know, we, we don't want to shoot Patriot missile systems or, or missiles at a $200,000 unmanned aerial system. We want to have multiple capabilities uh, as, as we go in the future. So I can see uh, us using directed energy capability. I can see us using electronic warfare capability. I can see us using gun capabilities. Uh, I, I, you know, we certainly could have that, that missile capability. Uh, it may be high-powered microwaves. There's, there's a lot of different capabilities that we're, we're developing, and our integrated battle command system will pick the right uh, system, the right shooter uh, tied to that sensor to allow us to protect the force. Um, and uh, two questions before I open it up. One is the Army's unmanned vision. I mean, the Army has been working with this technology, certainly partnered uh, with the Air Force and with the Navy on aerial systems and things like that. But what do you see as being sort of the vision of the Army when it comes to not just unmanned uh, ground, but air, uh, and, and combining that with uh, artificial intelligence and autonomy to a degree as, as a very, very powerful enabling tool. Yeah, I think I, think I could see you know, a lot of different things. What we, what we want to do is always pr uh, present our adversaries multiple dilemma dilemmas. So you know, we've done a lot of stuff. We did it when we were in Iraq back in 2004 man-on-man -man teaming, you know, Apaches with right. unmarial systems, us standing back, them lazing for us and, and those type things. And so that's been done for quite a while. But I, I can see unmanned unman teaming, you know, where a, you know, a unmanned system goes forward and it releases, you know, small unmanned systems. And if you're going to, you're going to, you know, if you're going to penetrate, you know, an integrated air defense type system, I could see that happening. Uh, on the ground, I can see, uh, I don't see why would ever clear a minefield or, you know, go down a road that we thought we had IEDs with, with a manned uh, vehicle in the lead. And some of the technology that we're developing, um, you know, this integrated visual augmentation system that allows, it's, 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 it's very similar to a little bigger than a set of oak leaf glasses that has night vision capability but can also uh, feed in uh, video capability. You know, I, I can, in, in the way it will work is you may be sitting in the third vehicle, but with the visual optics you have, you're actually thinking that you're in the lead vehicle. Right. And people say that's far, it's not. I mean, we do that in Apache helicopter right now. It's just not as good. You know, you've got a helmet display unit, but the person, the thing you're flying off is actually in the front of the aircraft. Right. So there's a lot of capability that we can do. Um, when I look at, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, you know, I see, we, you know, we talk about optionally manned, I, I'm more into the minim minimally manned, you know, type capability. We certainly, in some places, you know, if we're gonna move a large amount of troops, and, you know, we got a ranger, you know, unit or something like that going in, I don't necessarily see us uh, putting them in an aircraft and having no one up front, you know? Imagine, right. that you, you know, you got 30 rangers going in somewhere, and you kind of, you know, they, they look up front, and there's no one there, you know, and it's like, <laughs> well, good luck, I, I don't see that. Now, I can see where, we may not need a four-person crew because the aircraft, you know, knows how to navigate. Right. The aircraft will do a lot of that type of thing. So or a future armored vehicle may not necessarily need a loader in it. For that's example. right. That's exactly right. Or, or you know, I've asked that. I said, why do we have four people in a tank? 
And people look at me and they go, well, of course you got to have four people in a tank. You got to have a tank commander, you got to have a driver, you got to have a gunner and a loader. That's and that's and they give you the attitude that you're an aviator and you just don't get it. Well, yeah, that's, it's probably a good idea. But anyway, I'm the chief now. So it's like, no, but I mean, but, you know, if you start to think about it right. and you understand what that means, you know, first of all, if you put four people in a vehicle, you got to hire four people. The second thing is you got to protect them and now you got to build around them. And then you got to start thinking about all the other things that go in that. So if every person counts and a machine can do it, then let the machine do it. You know, I, as we looked at aircraft, uh, you know, there's always discussion about you know, when we build the Comanche helicopter, should it be single pilot or should it be, you know, two pilots? And, and really what drove a lot of that was navigation. You know, back in the day, and for the older people, you know, the, the most important person in the flight was the navigator. They had a huge map, and at night you're flipping through this map trying to make sure you stayed in this black line. Now, you know, with, with, with GPS and you all have in your cars, you just kind of punch in a grid, you know, and you, you know exactly where you're at. And as we get more into autonomous systems, the aircraft will fly you or the vehicle will drive you. The thing I want to do is there's going to be problem sets. You know, if you look, a lot of, you know, when you look at autonomous vehicles, they have a hard time making left-hand turns in traffic, you know. So you may need to be attentive for that time during that time frame. Or, you know, if you're approaching a difficult thing, you might need to have one person, but you don't need to have four people. Maybe right. one person can do that. Then you have to start thinking about how you do other things as far as, you know, um, some people say, well, who's going to do the maintenance? Well, maybe it's robotics that come up if you, you know, if you lose a track and they change it for you or if you're a pit crew. There's different ways of doing things. But what's important is, is what you find, like, on the phone. I use that, go back to my phone there. It was the experts in the phone that incrementally approved that thing. You know, the phone expert, the people that have been in that field, if you ever want to read a good book, read Range, because that's, that's how you will solve that phone problem by incrementally improving that phone. Someone came along, maybe a computer person, and said, hey, we can do this, this, and this, because they weren't constrained right. by the way you would do it. You know, the cavalry, you know, back in the day, they wanted faster horses. And there's that famous picture in World War II where we put horses in vehicles and, you know, drove the horses to the battlefield because... That's what we wanted to do, you know. Right. So somehow we got to get after that innovation, and you got to think differently about it if you're going to do it. You need more Eisenhower's and patents uh, <laughs> out, out there. Um, let me ask you uh, a quick nuclear yeah. question before I open it up um, uh, to the audience. Some of the smartest nuclear minds in the nation used to be Army people, uh, but you know, after the end of the Cold War, it became the purview sort of of the Air Force and, and of the Navy. Uh, but we're going back into a very much more nuclear world, right? North Korea is expected to do an atmospheric nuclear test. Uh, Russians, by uh, virtue of their strategy, want to escalate to de-escalate, which is used in a, a nuclear weapon earlier on in a conflict. Are, are we spending, as senior leaders, do you guys spend enough time and, and war game when some of these conflicts go nuclear? Because on some of these, we're talking about protracted conventional wars. And I'm suspecting between the United States and China, the minute you, you know, we take out, do something in Bohai, or they attack Los Angeles, I, I don't think it's going to be carrier battle groups that are going to be slugging it out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Do you spend enough time, and are you comfortable enough that the thinking is clear and we understand escalation, and and we're thinking about the most dangerous weapon ever made? No, I, I think I, we're doing a lot more thinking about those type things, and I think that's you know. The national defense strategy is driving that, you know. And again, we, we see ourselves at an inflection point. Um, you know, again, last 18, 19 years, you focused on the fight you have, and the fight we had was irregular warfare, it was counterterrorism, it was counterinsurgency. It, we, there's a shift going on right now. And so when we do our, you know, war games, when, when our troops do their training at, at the tactical level, we're doing the training at our level, at the operational strategic level, uh, those, uh, uh, challenges are, are, are integrated into the type of exercise we do and do, do we move yeah sure we, we, we want to get better at it and we're also taking a look at the type of people that we have in the army you know and, and getting those right skill sets into place and, and that's why from where I sit is I want to get a much more agile uh, personnel system and a talent management system and, and we're starting to get those type things so you, you want to talk nuclear you want to talk some I can hire someone you know right now major lieutenant colonel I got a nuclear problem I can go out there and go out to industry and say hey you want to be a lieutenant colonel and come in you know if you any data scientist I'm looking for them it's someone that's really good that understands data and I'll make you a major or something like that you come on in you can serve you can help us solve these problems that's a, a absolutely brilliant idea I want to open it up to the floor we're gonna have 15 uh, minutes of questions identify yourself uh, at the beginning no editorial comments and get to the question 
question. Uh, and I want to start with Frank because I think you've got a thoughtful question from what I understand. <laughs> Thanks very much, General. So I want to, one of the things that we've often heard and we didn't have a chance to talk too much about here is um, that the military is more heavily relying on critical infrastructure, um, particularly energy, uh, electric grid and the like, uh, ISPs, telecommunications. Uh, that's both uh, here in the United States uh, to move out um, and also uh, in whether, whatever theater we might be in, hypothetically, Europe. So my question really is, um, how do we protect the critical infrastructure? Uh, we, you know, it's well known that we have Iranians, Russians, et cetera, probing at least, uh, maybe inside. Um, what does the Army need to do with respect to that uh, in terms of transportation, reinforcement, uh, the capacity to operate um, in those kind of questions? I think, I think from, you know, um, it, it's a great challenge and I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, we, we take an approach um, when it comes to any type of operation. Uh, we use an acronym we call PACE. It's primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. And, you know, we take a look at it, and if what we never want to do is be, you know, one course of action or one option type commander. So if we're de depending on this only port and there's no other way to go, then we probably haven't come up with a good plan. That doesn't mean we're not going to work with everyone to make sure that port works. Or if we're totally dependent on, you know, a satellite communications capability being up there, or if we're totally dependent on a GPS capability being there, we, we don't have a good plan. So um, we're building resilience into our plans, recognizing that we're going to be contested. And we got to assume that they're going to come after those type things. And then we got to be able to adapt. They can't be everywhere either, you know. And, but we build plans that are agile, agile with multiple options that allows us when they take one down, um, we can go someplace else. And that's what we're doing when, when it comes. I mean, you know, everyone's, yeah, we're doing a lot of stuff uh, in position, navigation, and timing, and making sure that um, we have those capabilities. And most of our systems are being designed in a contested environment where what happens if we're jammed? What happens if we don't have capability? What happens if they do this to us? And we don't have it all right. I'm certainly, we've got certainly room for improvement, but that's what we're getting after. And uh, dramatically expanding the cyber um, elements uh, of the force as well. Yeah. Sydney, I saw your hand uh, back there. Uh, Sydney Friedberg, Breaking Defense, General. Great to ha have you here. Uh, Vago, thanks for calling on me. Uh, to get an issue that you've touched on a bit and that's clearly very dear to your heart, you know, future Army aviation, manned and unmanned, versus these increasingly complex IADs. You referred to the Karbala Gap run by the Apaches that didn't go too well uh, in Iraq, and that was against guys with cell phones. Uh, and AK-47s, not against you know a modern you know Russian or Chinese computerized uh, system with yeah. well airliner killing missiles apparently, but they can also probably kill real targets. Uh, you know some people are saying you know why are we even making things optionally manned? Uh, you know how do you get through that as Army aviation when you're not stealthy, you're not 50,000 feet above the ground, uh, and you know you have a you have some things with people in them. Yeah, I think, I think what we're, we're trying to do is, is you know, present uh, multiple challenges or dilemmas to, to the enemy. And what I, what I mean by that, people go, hey, what, you know, where I think we make a mistake, at least I would suggest, is when you do missions that don't do that. If you just take a bunch of Apaches and you have them fly, you know, charge in, you know, like the charge of light brigade, uh, you're probably not going to be successful. But if you have ground forces coming and you have... Uh, aerial forces coming, you have unmanned forces coming, and you have artillery, and you've got a combined arms joint type fight. Uh, it prevents, it presents multiple dilemmas uh, to the enemy, and they can't be everywhere uh, either. And, you know, I think getting back to, we talked about the joint all domain command and control system, and we fight as a joint force. And what we want to do is, 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 is take advantage of, of the strengths that are available. So, you know, a integrated air defense system is not very good against long range precision fires because ra radars are very susceptible to taking down. So if you understand how the thing is set up, that allows you to open up holes 
and then to exploit, and, and then whether you're using maritime forces, you're using air forces, you're using ground forces, or a combination of both, that's how you get uh, the advantage, and that's how you get dominance. And what's really important is making sure all those people that are doing those jobs are really good. You know, it's one thing to have the capability. Uh, it, it's another thing to actually be able to do it. You, know, you can see from recent examples, there's people out there with, with weapon systems, but if you don't know how to use them or you don't properly employ them, uh, then you're not going to be successful. Fo Follow-up question. Um, are the chiefs talking about the challenges and issues that management of the deep strike, deep battle, right? I mean, this was, has been a bone of contention between the Army and the Air Force. Um, is this something that you guys are having free and open conversations on? And how, for example, deep strike, deep penetrating strike actually changes when the Army has an ability to reach out and touch somebody at 3,000 plus miles? Yeah, I think, I, I think right now we're working through uh, those type of concepts. I, I, I think, again, e even from, you know, we have this incredible capability in our Air Forces, uh, but they like the idea of having something that can reach out and maybe suppress that critical element, just like they liked it during, you know, I, I, I don't want to harken back to Desert Storm, but, you know, at the time that was a, uh, you know, f it was a great mission that was done uh, with the Apaches, but uh, by today's standards, we have much more capability to do that, you know, and again, we want to have, you know, if we can do it from, you know, a, a significant amount of uh, kilometers away, we want to do that. And uh, I, I just have to give a shout out to the Air Force uh, uh, helicopters that were the uh, the pointy the, the the navigational lead on that uh, large formation. So there were a handful of Air Force helicopters. No, that there was. Having covered it, and that's the true. You know, that it's interesting. You know how things have changed. At that time, that was a very very challenging mission because you yeah. know they, they they did not have the the navigation capability and, and on the. Uh, the 53s, the Air Force MH-53s, they did. And right. so they actually were able to get the Apaches to the point where their less reliable Doppler radars could do those type things. And I, I, I look at that mission and I go back to a mission that I saw happen when we were in Iraq. Uh, General Cody, if you talk to him, they, had, they planned that mission for right. months. Right. Uh, I, I remember being in Iraq in, in, in you know, the first week of April and being called up by a, a two-star, some you know, Major General Dempsey, and said, "Hey, they're getting overrun, and uh, the Jaff, and we've been there two days, and can you get down there and do some right. things?" And because we had, you know, GPS and moving map display, we were able to, and two great pilots, Cindy Roselle and a few other folks, they were able to quickly get down there and, right. and, and do it in minutes and save the day. And for us, it was another day at the office. But you know, I mean, that's how far we've come when you have those type capabilities. A little bit different from the uh, Cobras uh, you flew early in your career. Um, yes, sir, over here. And then the question, and the one right behind. Uh, my name is uh, Sang Min Lee. I'm a reporter from the Radio Free Asia. Uh, I have a question about the uh, US and South Korea joint military exercise, uh, which have been uh, suspended, which have been canceled or downsized the last uh, two years. So I want to have any plan to resume that US and South Korean joint exercise this year? Well, what well, I'll tell you, in fact, I met with your chief of staff uh, uh, yesterday, General Su, and um, you know we, we reinforced the, the strong partnership uh, that we have, and we talked about how important exercises are at every level. Just like I talked, you know, when you want to you want to make sure you're good at something, you have to rehearse and you have to practice. And the more rehearsals you do, the more practices you do, the better off you'll be. Uh, if it comes to some type of conflict. Now he also recognizes, as you recognize, that you know, there's, there's not tension, but you know, the, between diplomacy and exercises, and they are working that out right now as we speak. So you know, from a military standpoint, we always want to have the capability to train. And you know, the more we can train, the better off we are. But we do recognize uh, that we have civilian leadership that is also working the diplomatic channels, and, and, and that's all part of it. You know, every, you know, ideally, you know, every situation ends, in, uh, ends up in some diplomatic solution, and we prefer it not to get to a conflict before it does that. So we are not in conflict right now. We're in competition, but we would like to see them work through that, and, and we're prepared to support it. Gentleman behind in the purple tie. <coughs> Sir, I'm uh, Tap Blackburn from the Institute of Defense Analysis, and we've seen Russia and China um, starting to grow closer and closer in their military relationship. In fact, China participated in Center uh, 2019 uh, this last year. We saw the uh, bomber 
uh, uh, sortie between Russia and China uh, in the spring of this year. Um, uh, in addition to that, Russia has um, kind of aggressively gone after um, some of our traditional partners. They're doing a lot more with Pakistan. Um, they're also trying to develop a relationship with India. Um, could you comment a little bit on um, the Russia-China issue from the Army perspective, and um, how do we compete with Russia uh, in, these, uh, uh, in their efforts to go after our traditional partners? Yeah, I think um, you know, when, it, when it comes to Russia, and again, we, we, and China, uh, th there's certainly a, a, a competition type phase. We certainly don't want it to go uh, to a conflict. And, you know, we're, we're competing for friends and allies also, just like they are. Uh, what I've found, at least with my experience, and again, I've only seen 75 chiefs of staff, but these are all, you know, uh, strategic countries uh, in Europe. Uh, I met with 34 out of the 37 chiefs there. I uh, met with many of the senior leaders uh, in the Pacific and then Central and South America and, and even Africa. So what I find is, is you know, this, it's, it's very important uh, that we work with allies and partners. It really is. And I, I can't overstress that because and, and, um, they're doing the same thing. They're, they're competing for friends, you know, they're, they're, they're competing for access, they're competing for presence, and they're competing for influence. The problem with with, with some of these folks, they, they come with strings. And some of them, it's not strings, they come with ropes. And, you know, so they, they have to think about, you know, how much sovereignty do they want to have uh, when, when these countries come and invest in their infrastructure? They, do they want to own their airfields? Do they want to own their ports? And, and I think there's many, many countries that may not say it publicly, but they are very, very concerned privately. Uh, and what are the when you look at China and Russia, what are the capabilities they have that concern you the most? Well, nuclear weapons. That's a good answer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I mean, that's at the end of the day, that makes you know, you get nuclear weapons, it makes you an existential threat, and we don't ever want to get to a nuclear war. You know, people talk about great power conflict, a great power war, but a nuclear exchange between. Um, you know, great powers. We no one wants to go there, right? So that is absolutely it. Uh, additional questions? Yes, uh, gentleman here with the colored tie, and then uh, colorful tie, and then uh, uh, Byron Callen of Capital Alpha Partners. Jeremiah Rosman, uh, Association of the U.S. Army. Uh, we recently hosted a hot topic uh, with panelists about Russia and China, and one of the main takeaways was that our uh, bases in Europe uh, emit really massive electromagnetic signatures. So uh, what are some of the uh, future Army plans to, uh, to have better, perhaps, passive defenses and uh, reduce that? Yeah, so, you know, it, it, it's interesting. If, you know, if you've been to Afghanistan, um, because of, um, I want to say the low threat, um, if, you, if you've been to a, a, a company command or battalion command post, um, they've, you know, they got stadium seating, they got big, you know, TVs, they got all types of screens. They take about six to nine days to set up and you can never move them. Um, you go to our National Training Center right now, you do that and you last about a minute and a half because you can be targeted. So what are we doing? Uh, we're teaching people about those type things. That's a threat. Um, and we make you move all the time. We, we, we you know, we've got to inculcate uh, into um, a, a lot of great commanders who had that capability that speed matters. And if you stay somewhere too long, you're going to get hit. You, you have to be able to move. And about the first couple of times you try to set up that big tent and you realize how long it takes and, you know, in the stadium seats and the floor mats and all that other stuff, uh, you stop doing it and you get very lean and you only have the things that you need to do the job. And, you know, when you do it about six, nine, 12 times during a rotation, that's just the way you start to do business. You learn some lessons. So those are the type of things we're doing. But, you know, when I talk about multi-domain operations, th th this is a change. Because people say, this is just air land battle, you know, part. It's not. You fundamentally have to recognize uh, the type of battlefield that we're going to be on. Byron? Sure, sir. Byron Callen, Capital Alpha Partners. Uh, two to three years ago, General Milley and Secretary Esper in different capacities talked a lot about military operations in major urban areas, yeah. and that discussion just seemed to go away. I'm curious how the Army is thinking about that problem set now, how the Department is thinking about it. Is it just something you avoid or use other people's fists? 
No, I think I think it's 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 still there. Um, you know, if you go to our combat training centers, uh, you are very involved in you know whether it's Hugh Gordon or at NTC. You know, as far as operating in the cities, those of us went to combat and uh, you know fought in the cities, in Sardis City, in Fallujah, in in all those type places. So. Uh, we, we haven't walked away from that. We just, you know, we've, we've taken a look at what went on in Missoula, you know, as far as an urban type operation. Um, you know, the, the, there's tactics, techniques, and procedures, even, even the systems that we're, we're buying now. You know, as we take a look at some of the type of systems, you know, whether it's a future attack reconnaissance aircraft, you know, how does that operate in an urban environment? When we look at some of the, the next generation combat vehicles, how does that, you know, how, how, how much elevation do you need to have in the weapon system so you can engage in those type things? So I don't think we've walked away from it. It's just, there's just a lot of things that we're going to do. But, so. I'm going to use the moderator prerogative and ask two sort of very compressed short questions because I know that we've only got about two and a half minutes uh, of time. One is, a sense that I get across the force when you talk to soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines about the nature of the challenge. Obviously from leadership position you don't want to make adversaries 10 feet tall, but there are some folks who are also looking at those capabilities and saying, man, they are awfully daunting and I'm not sure my bosses really have got a beat on this uh, problem, whether we're not moving fast enough, et cetera. How do, you, how do you talk to troops when they look at it and be like, boss, you're, you're asking me to move on an incessant basis, my supply lines, the, the Navy acknowledges it doesn't have auxiliaries and oilers uh, enough uh, up, up to the task. How do, how do you talk to troops to get them zeroed in the in the right way, but also do it honestly, um, as J.D. Thurman puts it, you know, the modern war that we're in is going to be extremely violent and extremely bloody. So how yeah. do you, how do yeah, you? The reason I was smiling that? is, is anyone see the picture of Marshall Plumley? Talk about soldiers. Well, anyways, it, um, have you seen that picture? I, d I don't know. Okay, so so Marshall Plumley is a lieutenant, uh, United States Army, just completed Ranger School. He was an All-American at Duke, uh, played professional basketball uh, for the New York Knicks and Milwaukee Bucks. One of these kids just said, hey, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. I want to join. So he joined the Army. He goes to Ranger School. And I have a picture with him. And, and this kid is an incredible young man, but he's seven feet tall. So, you know, like I tell our adversaries, I'm not saying our, our Army's 10 feet tall, but it's pretty damn close. <laughs> <laughs> if you see this, I'll show you this picture after the thing. It's pretty cool. But, but you're right. I, I think... You know, what we're talking to soldiers is we're trying to get them ready. We have a, you know, I mean, we have a sacred obligation. Uh, you know, there's parents out there that send me their kids, you know, and they expect us to take care of them. And we're going to do that. In order to do that, we've got to train them hard because, you know, combat is unforgiving. And some of the characters that we're going to go after, some of the adversaries is, you know, they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're indiscriminate. Uh, they, they have no values. And we've got to make sure that our soldiers are the most highly trained, disciplined, and fit uh, soldiers in the battlefield, and they can win, and that's what we have to do. And what are some lessons that you're drawing from Cold War <coughs> tactics, doctrine, and even talking to that generation? Because that generation did fight the war from hell, which was Vietnam, which had high intensity, great power elements to it in a counterinsurgency context. And then they exited that to a pure great power competition back into the full de, full de gap. I mean, what are, who, who are you talking to and what are the lessons that can be drawn from that era even though it's different? Yeah, one of the reasons that you know, I, I kind of go through the dissertation of where we're coming from. You know, the reason I kind of explain that because I, you know, again, for a lot of our younger officers, they're not that young. I'm talking at the maybe lieutenant colonel colonel level, you know, for the last, you know. You're old. I know, I, I got it, you know, but, not, <laughs> but you know, 19 years, when you, when you think about it, things that we just, you know, for the older folks that serve in the Army, it's like, hey, we used to do Reforger, we had 300,000 soldiers in Europe. We you know all, MCON Alpha? Yeah, yeah, we had all these different type of things going on, and so when I, when I started to explain how we were trying to lead transformational change, you can't just go right to here. You have to go, hey, wait a minute, here's where we were. And as young men and women look around, they go, you know, things may be this divisive, but this is challenging. Hey, wait a minute, you know, we're things, you know, there's things we have to do, but there's a lot of good things too. So let's, let's just take deep breaths. Let's take a look at, you know, some of the other times people that were in the same place, maybe in 1977 or 1980-ish, what happened then? What can we learn from that? Now, we're not going to build an Apache helicopter now, but we may build a future attack reconnaissance aircraft or something like that. We're not going to do the same type things. We've got to recognize things have changed, but we can learn 
from what those senior leaders did during that time frame. We can learn of how they led us through a very, in some ways I would argue, a much more difficult situation. We're leading change, but we have an incredible army right now. I mean, they're really good. It's just, we just have to get them to shift. We have to recognize, or they have to recognize, what is their perspective? What, what do they know? They, they, they've, they've all been in combat, the leaders, multiple combat tours. But again, we're not fighting that last fight. We've got to get ready for the next fight. And we've got to shift them. We've got to help them shift. And so we're, we're taking them from where they were. We're saying, hey, this is not new. We've done similar things. And now here's how we're going to get to the future. And we've got to walk them through so they can visualize we're here. We can learn from what happened here. And here's where we're going into the future. And, and I think that's kind of soothing if the leadership are comfortable and we lay out, you know, where we're going and they can see it. General Jim McConville, 40th Chief of Staff of the United States Army, sir, it was an honor and pleasure. Uh, thanks very much for joining us here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you to the Council. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks Happy New Year. Good to see you. Good to see you.